Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting webinar in our GPCR series. On behalf of DiscoverX, I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. I'm your moderator, Poonam Kaul, who is the product manager for GPCR, Kinase, and other cell-based assay services at DiscoverX. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is designed to be interactive, and you can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box that appears on the top of your screen, and we will be answering the question and answers at the end of the talk. Today's webinar titled Discovery of Bacterial Effectors in the Human Microbiome and Isolation of a GPCR GPR-132 agonist is being presented by Dr. Louis Cohen. Dr. Louis Cohen, MD, is an assistant professor and practicing gastroenterologist in the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He is both certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. His clinical interests focus on patients with inflammatory bowel disease and other inflammatory disorders of the bowel. In addition to his medical degree, Dr. Cohen has a master's in translation research from the Rockefeller University in New York City, where he studied in the lab of Dr. Sean Brady. Dr. Cohen is also an NIH-funded researcher whose basic science focuses on postmicrobial interactions. In today's webinar, Dr. Cohen will be focusing on his work with the human microbiome and the utility of functional metagenomics and high content imaging in the identification of effector genes and small molecules that improve our understanding of how bacteria might interact with human cells and contribute to both health and disease. And I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Cohen um, to start this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much for that nice introduction, and I definitely want to thank DiscoverX uh, for giving me the opportunity to come and uh, give this webinar. And certainly the work that I'm going to present today, um, you know, would not have been possible without, uh, you know, the, the assistance from DiscoverX. And, you know, I hope that this will be an exciting topic for people in the audience because, you know, I think what it presents is sort of a, a new concept in terms of how we can think um, you know, in general about the human microbiome, uh, and more specifically about how humans and their, their resident flora set up um, a symbiotic relationship. And, um, you know, finally, from a, from a pure GPCR perspective, to start to think about novel ways that we can get at um, new types of GPCR ligands and think about new ways in which we can, uh, you know, modulate GPCRs uh, therapeutically. And so with that, um, we'll just sort of present a general overview of what I'm going to go through today. Uh, you know, first I'll, I'll touch briefly on uh, the role of the human microbiome in health and disease. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of the audience, I, I, I have a feeling most people are going to be familiar with the general concepts of the microbiome, and I'll provide my, um, you know, sort of uh, outer space view of it. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a technique that we've been developing and refining in terms of one approach to study the human microbiome, which involves the application of functional metagenomics as a discovery tool to begin to, to, to look at more, more specific mechanisms through which bacteria have the ability to, to interact with host physiology. And we'll talk about a screening approach that we, we, we built uh, coupling high content imaging uh, you know, again, with our, our functional uh, metagenomic strategy. And then finally, I'll touch a bit on, you know, where I think we can uh, go with this approach in the future and especially tie in, you know, uh, more targeted or, and or untargeted uh, GPCR screening efforts. So, you know, this is a, it, it's a busy slide and it, it sort of can consolidates a lot of different concepts, I think, that you know, you hit, hit, hit on uh, the human microbiome and where the state of research is at the moment. So, you know, in the, in the general background of the slide, there's a human body, and we see, you know, coming off of that human body, different as different sort of bacterial populations. And this idea that 
humans were home to a rich flora, you know, of bacteria and viruses and fungi, and that the composition of this flora differed in different body sites is not a new concept. You know, it's been something that's been understood for, for, for ages. But I think what, what is new and, and what has been sort of what's led to this, um, you know, tremendous explosion and in interest in the human microbiome, which is evidenced here in this chart showing, you know, a pretty exponential rise in the number of citations and publications, you know, over the last decade, is that I think we've come to look at our relationship with these, with, 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 with our native flora a little differently. You know, I think for, for a long time, we, we viewed this as almost an antagonistic relationship, that we were defending ourselves against them. And I think what we've come to understand is that that's not really the case, that, that the microbiome can be thought of, um, you know, people have said this, as, as its own organ. You know, it has tremendous metabolic potential and has tremendous potential to, to set the tone for our immune system, um, our metabolic system, and, and really be that first barrier in terms of how we, how we interact with, with the larger environment of the world around us and the medications we take and the diet we take in. So this idea of this symbiotic relationship and the fact that the microbiota are critical to the normal development of our immune system has, has taken off. And it's taken off because of improvements and, you know, more attention to mouse model systems where we can show in mice that by just manipulating bacterial species, we can elicit changes in the host phenotype, you know, including obesity or diabetes. But also it's come from um, how uh, cost effective it has been to sequence, uh, you know, the bacterial populations inside of us, which allowed us to start making intriguing observations, seeing that there's differences um, in patient cohorts, that the bacteria that might live inside people who are obese are different from those who live inside people who might be thin. So with all these observations, though, you know, it really starts to, to, to raise an interesting question, which is, you know, there's a lot of diseases we've now associated with the human microbiome through both mouse and in and, and human studies, and that the potential impact of understanding the diseases, you know, numbers the millions of patients in the United States alone. And so, you know, I think that there's now a big push where, you know, there, there's buy-in, and our curiosity has been piqued, and we believe that there really is something here, um, and, and that there's a potential, both therapeutically, to, 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 to understand the microbiome better and, and to maybe impact a lot of people. But what I think we have now is, is a gap. Um, we, we have a gap in our knowledge base that we're starting to also build on, which is about function. So we, there's a lot of interesting correlations in human studies, and there's even causative studies in mice, but we know very, very little about specific mechanisms through which um, the microbiota, including the bacteria, are able to, to, to elicit these host responses. So, you know, what are the molecules? What are the surface receptors? What are the proteins? What are the things that bacteria make or do that would allow them to affect host physiology? Because it's in those interactions that we can start to see the therapeutic potential of the microbiome. So, you know, breaking this down into a more simplistic way of thinking about it, the way that I think about it, you know, on the top here, we have these really interesting correlative studies in humans, you know, associations of disease populations. And in mice, we have these more causative studies, you know, associate this bacteria and we see this phenotype. And then somewhere from there through here, at the bottom, we have this potential to impact the health of millions of people. And, and I believe that this impact comes in these interactions, the interactions between individual bacteria and host cells, such that we can see two potential ways of interacting. One is that bacteria are affecting the host cell. And this would be the idea that something the bacteria is doing or making has the ability to interact with our physiology, and that interaction has a therapeutic potential because we can either down-regulate it or up-regulate it once we identify these specific mechanisms. But on the other side, you know, it may not be that the bacteria are affecting host physiology. It might be that the opposite is true, that through changes in the host, bacterial populations are shifting, so that the host is affecting these bacteria. And that, that isn't a bad thing, but it suggests that instead of a therapeutic potential, 
that bacteria have a diagnostic potential, that they're incredibly sensitive reporters of what's happening in our body, and they may, by monitoring bacterial populations, maybe we can get better insight into disease diagnosis or therapeutic monitoring and things of that nature. But ultimately, it requires better understanding these fundamental interactions, these specific mechanisms, if we're going to start to begin to sort of tease out, you know, how we can study the microbiome in a way that ultimately affects uh, human health. Unfortunately, it's not a simple set of interactions that, you know, among all the potential ways that bacteria and host cells can interact, they can, bacteria can make things, the host can make things, and then we have all the other stuff that's coming down the pipeline, <laughs> quote, unquote, um, in terms of what we eat or what we're exposed to in the environment. So it creates a very complex system. So what I've done is chosen to, to focus my efforts a bit. And so, you know, when I think about, again, all the different types of ways that bacteria and host cells can interact through cell surface receptors or metabolism of, meta uh, of, of um, environmental antigens or products or just secretion of primary metabolites, you know, I've chosen to think more about how bacteria interact with host cells because I'm interested sort of in, in therapeutic discovery. And I've chosen to focus my effort among all these potential interactions on small molecules. And the reason that I'm interested in small molecules is that we know from the study of environmental microbiomes, such as the soil, that bacteria make small molecules as a way to establish virulence or symbiosis, and that these molecules have really been the backbone of therapeutic discovery for, you know, almost 50 years, comprising in one way or another, you know, these types of natural products, you know, upwards of 52% or more of, of drugs that are on market. So, you know, there's a great potential when thinking about how much we know about environmental microbiomes that as we switch to the study of the human microbiome, the study of small molecules can, can, can be quite rewarding. However, at this point, we know almost nothing uh, about the small molecules that human microbiota make and how those molecules might have that same potential. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story and our approach that led us to the discovery of, of one type of molecule from a class of molecules called NACLAMINES. The second part of the story will be how the discovery of this molecule led us to understand that, you know, just like with host physiology, just like with human physiology, that bacteria also, I believe, are going to utilize GPCRs as a key mechanism through which they, they interact with us and they establish this sort of symbiotic relationship. So traditional small molecule isolation approaches have involved going to the environment, getting a bacteria culturing that bacteria in vitro in large-scale fermentation systems, and then you extract the, um, the supernatant, and then from that organic extract, you can partition it and begin, you know, through a process of bioassay-guided fractionation, bioassay-guided discovery, to start to identify molecules that are of therapeutic interest. Now, while quite successful and still a cornerstone of our therapeutic discovery pipelines, you know, this approach has limitations like all. One is it requires that you're able to culture these bacteria. Two, as you go through a bioassay-based fractionation or bioassay-guided strategy, you're going to have other molecules that are going to track with your molecule of interest, and these molecules may be toxic or inhibitory. And ultimately, these types of problems have led to an incredibly high rediscovery rate. So an alternative strategy or complementary strategy is, is functional metagenomics. So instead of isolating individual bacteria, we instead isolate um, bacterial DNA. And we isolate what's called metagenomic DNA, meaning we'll get all the DNA from a bacteria in an environmental sample. We then take fragments of that DNA, and we put fragments into host bacterial species. So now each colony on this plate represents one host species that has a unique piece of foreign DNA. And the idea is that that foreign DNA may encode a new function. So then you can subject these metagenomic clones to functional screening. So for instance, that new function, you know, the clone may change a color, which often is a signal that it's making a new small molecule. It may have a new functional property, such as this clone, which is able to, to inhibit the growth of bacteria that you put on top of it. It has now antibiotic properties. And once you identify these phenotypic changes, you can then go to the metagenomic clone and start to isolate new effectors. 
So again, this helps to circumvent culture barriers because we're going to use host bacterial species to express DNA. The second thing it lets us do is it lets us get immediately at biosynthetic genes. Because traditionally, as we grow bacteria, even though they can be tough to grow, they can be even harder to manipulate genetically. And in this case, we know that whatever molecules are being made, we can immediately link back to that piece of DNA that we isolated from the environment. So, you know, when we thought about the application of this to humans, because until that point it had really been largely applied in environmental settings, you know, we were excited. Um, and we were also excited because we knew that as we started to identify these genes in a host bacteria, it presented a new way of thinking about how to manipulate the human microbiome therapeutically. That basically you can manipulate the genes of the bacteria, you can introduce bacteria into the microbiome carrying these genes, and you could actually deliver therapeutic small molecules at their site of action in, at, in the microbiome itself. So we were excited because we felt like we were also developing an endogenous delivery system, you know, for the therapeutic small molecules we identified. So the first question we then asked is, well, what would be the phenotype of interest to us? You know, what would be the, the thing that the small molecules are interacting with that we would find to be exciting? And what we wanted to first do was just be very broad and develop a system whereby we could identify a molecule that's capable of perturbing a host cell. So what we did was we set up an NF-kappa B reporting system because we knew that NF-kappa B pathways in human cells are turned on really as a central regulator of, of cellular homeostasis. So that if there's some perturbation to the cell, and this can integrate hundreds of cell surface receptors and processes, NF-kappa B pathways are turned on. So while it may not be a specific marker of a host interaction, it'll start to identify potential um, bioactive uh, small molecules. So we then began to set up a screening system. So we started with human samples, specifically stool samples. We isolated the metagenomic DNA from those stool samples, and then we took those pieces of the DNA and we put it into a host bacterial species such that each well of a microplate contained one unique metagenomic clone with a unique piece of, of DNA from the human microbiome. We would then allow those clones to grow up in a 384 well plate, and we would transfer the, the supernatant that hopefully contains some new metabolite, some new molecule, onto our human cellular reporters, which we could then observe for a phenotypic change. And so we use high content imaging to look at our human cellular reporters, and we could see here, you know, in one well, that clone now has the ability to turn on NF kappa B pathways, which are green, whereas in our control well, you know, the pathways remain uh, largely turned off. And just looking more closely at our system, we used, uh, in, in terms of our reporter cells, it was a GFP reporter system in HEC293 cells, such that when NF-kappa B is active, it binds to its transcription fight, uh, sites and then leads to expression of GFP. Our host bacteria was E. coli, um, which is very easy to manipulate. And we would also stay in nuclei and dead cells um, as other potential parameters uh, to, to follow. And so using this system, we can then identify a single clone in a single well that now has the ability to turn on NF-kappa B pathways. And that ability, we know again, it was given to it based on whatever functions are encoded on that piece of DNA. And then it becomes fairly straightforward. We can now isolate that DNA again. We can subject that DNA to, to random mutagenesis and then figure out which gene on that foreign piece of DNA is the bioactive gene, is the biosynthetic gene, based on its knockout or its knockdown um, leading to a loss of the, the new phenotype we observed. So we can very quickly get a bioactive genes, and then you can take that same clone and introduce it into a culture system. And what's nice is that in this system, you have an excellent control because you have the same host species without that piece of DNA making it much easier to identify new metabolites using techniques such as LCMS. And then from that, we can then isolate the metabolites and now providing a, a more complete uh, circle. Again, starting with genes, um, looking at specific functions of interest, and those functions being able to be attributed directly to uh, new molecules. And from this screen, we were able to identify a lot of clones that were active. Uh, basically, one out of every 500 metagenomic clones we looked at um, was able to turn on NF-kappa B pathways. And then in terms of unique clones, 
once we started to isolate the specific effector genes, the specific biosynthetic genes, about one out of every 3,000 clones we looked at gave us a novel effector gene. And, you know, this next slide sort of hits at what I was talking about earlier, which is that when we looked at these genes and we looked in the NCBI data set of sequenced bacterial genes, all of them had been sequenced before. You know, all of these genes have been known, and, that, and that's really a credit to the tremendous efforts that have been spent in sequencing the human microbiome. But then when you look in a database such as SwissProt to say, well, do, what do we know about the functions of these genes, you know, we don't know very much. That the identity of these genes are still a very low identity of genes that have been characterized functionally. So again, this idea of a function gap. And so now coming back to the interactions with host cells, based on this screening approach, we were able to start to fill in a lot of interesting gaps. We found stress response regulatory genes. We found proteins that seem to be uh, interacting with host cells. And we found a lot of chemistry, a lot of transferases and hydrolases that suggested that metabolites were being made um, that might have um, even more direct therapeutic potential. And so we focused our effort on a family of acyl transferases because it was a gene that we found in all the patient samples we looked at. And so it suggested a very fundamental gene uh, in the human microbiota. And not only that, it was a gene that when we looked at larger data sets seemed to be restricted to commensal bacteria. So again, taking this approach, we knew the gene, we then grew the bacteria, and from, those, from that gene, we, we isolated uh, four molecules that were being produced. All of them were part of the same family, um, which is basically an N-acyl amide. And so what you see here is an amine group, in this case glycine, that's N-linked to an acyl group. And uh, this enzyme was able to accommodate a narrow range of long-chain lipids, ranging from C14 to C18 with a double bond. So now we had a structure. And when we saw this structure, it was actually, you know, it, it struck us because it, it showed a tremendous amount of structural similarity to human signaling molecules. So we had a molecule on top being made by a bacteria, and we could see almost identical molecules that human cells make as a way to signal. This, and that these human signaling molecules all acted through GPCRs. So we see the endocannabinoids here on the left, which are also N-acylamides, and we see other structures here. And based on this, these structural variations in the head group, the amine group, and the tail, we see different GPCRs that these uh, bioactive lipids are able to signal through. So that's what then said to us, well, maybe our bacterial molecule also signals through a GPCR. And the idea that bacteria can signal through GPCRs, um, you know, while not entirely new, was very exciting to us, especially for the human microbiome, because of what I think most people here understand, which is the tremendous therapeutic potential of GPCRs. So we see here a figure looking at GPCRs that have been implicated in diseases and just how connected these GPCRs are to each other. And more importantly, on the outer ring, we see the therapeutic potential in that a lot of these GPCRs can be targeted and they've led to incredibly successful drugs on market. So we now saw this opportunity that bacteria have the ability to interact with these same systems and potentially opening up uh, inroads into both uh, discovery in terms of disease pathophysiology as well as therapeutic potential. And the idea that bacteria can make metabolites that interact with GPCRs, you know, is pretty straightforward because many endogenous GPCR ligands are very simple peptides, very simple um, fatty acids, sugars. So, you know, bacteria are more than capable of making very complex molecules. But these types of simple modifications are, are, are even more basic. And we know from other research on the microbiome that bacteria do have the ability to decarboxylate tryptophan and, and to make some of these basic modifications leading to uh, bioactive precursors or GPCR ligands themselves. So what, at that point, what had really been known about GPCR-mediated interactions with microbiota was largely limited to short-chain fatty acids, where we knew bacteria have the ability to make short-chain fatty acids that can interact with three different GPCRs, 41, 43, and 109, and these interactions have the potential to regulate T cells and dendritic cells. But nobody had really been looking systematically uh, at these interactions, and, and short-chain fatty acids, while clearly important, you know, had, had really not been something that was a, was a new discovery uh, per se, but uh, so we then said, well, let's 
you know, partner with DiscoverX and utilize their platform that allowed us to take a bacterial ligand that just based on hypothesis should have some interaction with a GPCR, and we were able to screen them against their whole panel of both known and, un and orphan uh, GPCRs. So with 168 GPCRs, we screened for agonist and antagonist activity, and among their 72 orphan GPCRs, we screened for agonist activity. And what we found here was an incredibly specific interaction with the receptor G2A. So now suddenly this was even more exciting to us because we, we had a hypothesis that we could generate. Because when you knock out G2A in mouse models, they develop a colitis, they develop an autoimmune phenotype, and they can even develop atherosclerosis all diseases that have been linked to the microbiome. So suddenly now we're building a mechanistic hypothesis whereby a potentially very common metabolite that bacteria make can interact through GPCRs that would provide an explanation as to how bacteria could relate to human diseases of the microbiome. And so, you know, looking again at this, we, we said, well, there should be a structure activity relationship because small modifications in these different groups lead to tremendously different GPCR activities. And we were able to show that by modifying the tail or by drastic modifications in the head group, you get either slight changes in the activity, you know, from small changes in the fatty acid tail, to actually abolishing the activity if you were to make a large change, such as introducing a medium chain uh, fatty acid or uh, a very structurally different head group, again, leading to loss of activity at the G2A receptor. So this was also using DiscoverX's individual GPCR screening methods. So again, going from a huge panel to then narrowing on targeted GPCRs and doing more dedicated structure activity uh, relationship type assays. So now coming back to, again, the overall picture and this function gap, um, we are able to now start inserting products that suggest not that bacterial products and host products are different, but that there's a shared structural background. And that this shared structure, I think, also um, points at the idea that GPCRs are really going to be a key component of how host and bacterial products interact. And so, you know, in the future, what we hope to do is expand this approach. Um, we're interested in expanding our metagenomic libraries into disease cohorts. We want to think about other aspects of the human microbiome beyond the stool and develop new strategies to new, use different host bacteria. But I also think that there's a lot of potential to do more focused GPCR screening efforts, to target individual GPCRs. We also think that you know, many of the orphan GPCRs could very well have ligands where, that are endogenous, but they're not endogenous to the human system, they're endogenous to the, to the microbiome. And you know, we think it'll be interesting to look at GPCR families as well. And this system is um, quite amenable to, you know, scaling up such that from a single library plate, um, you can actually assay multiple GPCRs simultaneously. So obviously this work couldn't have been possible without um, a lot of different people, you know, many people at the Brady Laboratory at Rockefeller, as well as a lot of the institutes there and uh, people at Steinai. And so I want to thank you again for giving me the, the chance to uh, talk today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again for attending, and we are now open to Q&A. So what you can do is type your questions on the top of your screen, uh, and Dr. Cohen will respond to those questions. Uh, I also wanted to tell everybody that we will be sending a copy of these slides and the webinar recording after the, after the webinar. I just want to remind you, I can't see the questions, so if you could just read yes. them to me as they come up, it would be yes. great. Yes. Yes. So the first question is, have you tested cell arrest in response to the G2A agonist? It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So, you know, G2A's original discovery um, was in the setting of actually uh, cancer cells in terms of looking at its ability to arrest cell cycle. So, um, you know, in terms of going more deeper into G2A physiology, um, we, we haven't necessarily uh, done that. We've been sort of busy 
um, you know, really kind of trying to get out there and characterize a lot of these metabolites. One thing I'll say, though, is that we, in our assays, we never saw any effect on cell number. So, you know, in a setting of being exposed to this particular um, uh, agonist, we, we didn't see any changes in our, in our cell types that we studied in terms of its proliferation, um, the, the numbers, or any evidence of toxicity. Um, G2A also has potential chemotactic uh, responses. And, we, and we, we think that the chemotaxis may, may be a really important mechanism of what it's doing in vivo. Um, but in terms of sort of uh, halting that cell cycle, uh, you know, we, we haven't explored that in some of the cell lines that would be more specific to that question. But it's a good question. So another question is, uh, Dr. Cohen, how did the activation of NF-kappa-B GFP correlate with data and G2A signaling? Yeah, so th that's another great question. The, the correlation between NF-kappa B and G2A in terms of what, how we think those pathways uh, interact, you know, again, it, it, where NF-kappa B is such a ubiquitous signaling system, um, you know, mapping out the specific connections is not something that we've tackled at the moment. You know, it's very, it's, it's quite possible that, you know, NF-kappa B is a critical part of G2A signaling. Um, because again, you know, G2A we see being quite expressed in immune cells where NF-kappa B is critical um, as part of their inflammatory response. Um, it's also possible that these are, these are unrelated. You know, that the, the way we set up the NF-kappa B system was really to give us a generic reporter. You know, we're, we're so little is known about the microbiome, we wanted the molecules themselves to guide us more than the screening efforts. And so, you know, the, the, the purpose of this assay was always to set up a very sort of basic approach at phase one. And then as we understand more about the structure and the potential function of the, the, the molecules and or enzymes or proteins we identify, to start to either then uh, introduce that into primary cellular systems where we can really start to tease out some of the more mechanistic aspects. So. You know, my, my suspicion is that NF-kappa B and G2A are going to be related, but to my knowledge, there's not a lot um, out there at the moment that has really looked at that specific relationship and how, um, uh, you know, interaction with that receptor, uh, you know, then leads to certain pathways being turned on in the NF-kappa B system, which, again, can be quite uh, robust. Although NF-kappa B, you know, bringing in the other question, you know, can have dramatic effects on cell cycle progression and so it's very possible, again, that there's that there's a that there's a significant link here. Okay. Another question is: Have you identified any other effector genes that are small molecules that signal through other signaling, intracellular signaling, or other cell surface receptors like RTK? Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, you know, we've found uh, right now we're hoping um, to start coming out uh, with publication soon. But we have found other small molecules that are interacting with uh, 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 other G protein couple receptors. So, you know, we, we have become very interested in this space. Um, and we, we've also found small molecules that appear to be interacting with uh, certain types of ion channels and, and some, um, you know, other uh, receptor types. But, you know, in terms of the kinases, um, you know, we, we haven't looked down that road at the moment, but, but I have a, a strong suspicion um, that that is going to be another, you know, all these systems that are really fundamental parts of human cell signaling, um, you know, I think bacteria can interact with them as well. And I think that the, you know, the, the other take home point is that these interactions are going to be very generic. You know, they're going to be very basic, simple metabolites because, you know, there's so much diversity in the human microbiome that the conservation that allows, you know, individual people to still share a similarity in terms of their physiology you know, has to come down to the types of metabolites and things like that that the bacteria make. So I think we're, while we see, you know, great ecologic diversity, I think that what we're starting to gonna identify is that there's a little bit more conservation in terms of a lot of the signaling molecules bacteria use. And I, th I think they are gonna be simple, simple metabolites. Uh, are there any other reporter systems besides the one that you have used uh, that people use? Uh, 
for identification of the vector genes? Yeah, I mean, so I, I would say that basically any, you know, we've tackled a, a few different reporter systems, and, you know, all the, the, the strategy that we've set up, I think is amenable to just about any reporter system of interest. You know, I think there's a couple caveats. One, you know, screening efforts can get quite expensive. So, you know, I, I definitely am a fan of a lot of the fluorescent reporter systems because they're, they're cheap. The second thing um, is that, you know, in terms of thinking about this, this system and this assay, it, um, it, it's important that you consider the, the effect of the host bacteria. So, you know, we use E. coli, and E. coli natively is going to make its own set of metabolites and ligands, and, you know, these are going to have effect on host cells. So some of the reporter systems that we've looked at, for instance, you know, if you're looking at a reporter system, for instance, for TLR2 signaling, you know, using a human cell that expresses a lot of TLR2, I mean, you're going to get a lot of background noise. So there's, there's certain reporter systems where you have to be very cognizant of the, the, the human cell type you use because you may get a lot of interference from your host bacterial species. Um, you know, with that said, it also opens up opportunity because if you see a loss of that interference, you know, again, it suggests that you're honing in on things um, that, are metab the, that are modulating the, the bacterial phenotype still. Uh, so there's another question. Uh, G2A has been shown to play a tumor suppressive role in lymphoid leukemia by Avin Witt's group at UCLA. Have you explored yep. these effects? Yeah, so, so, you know, that was the first, uh, you know, the first, uh, uh, how G2A was discovered and actually why it was ended up calling G2A. So we, we, we haven't necessarily looked at that yet. Um, you know, my, again, my suspicion is is that, you know, its native physiology is going to be more around um, cellular migration and things like that. However, from a therapeutic standpoint, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential for these types of things to be seen. You know, one thing that's tough with some of the lipid molecules, obviously, is that, you know, I, 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 I can definitely say that at, at high enough concentrations, these molecules you know, are always toxic because they, they, they integrate into the membrane. But, you know, at lower concentrations is where you start to see that modulatory activity. And, um, you know, I think it'll be very interesting to think about how bacterial delivery of these types of molecules, you know, could have a role potentially uh, therapeutically. I, I do think that a lot of these molecules, especially these NACLAMIDs, they do act very locally. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't envision one day giving a bacteria that makes commendamide as a mechanism to treat systemic leukemia, just because I think that commendamide gets metabolized very quickly at the intestinal mucosa or very quickly once it sort of gets into systemic circulation. But you could imagine, you know, obviously there are GI malignancies. GI malignancies have been uh, tightly linked to the microbiome, and perhaps by introducing bacteria that tend to have a suppressive effect down the malignant pathway, you know, you might imagine that this is a protective mechanism. Now, obviously, those types of studies are, are very complicated to do in humans over the long run, but, you know, it's, it's something fun that, that we like to think about. Um, there's one more question. Uh, is the G2A agonist effect defined by arrestin recruitment alone or other G protein readouts too? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, obviously the DiscoverX platform relies on arrest and recruitment. Um, you know, we love the DiscoverX platform the most because it's, uh, at least for these initial phases, because it's so specific to a ligand receptor interaction, which is what we really want to define. Um, we haven't actually looked at secondary signaling systems yet, um, in, you know, such as cyclic AMP or, 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 or other systems might be specific to that receptor. So I can't say um, uh, at this point. You know, again, th this study was sort of the very first one we did, and we've since, you know, focused our attention really in defining new metabolites and sort of, a, you know, trying to create a library, uh, so to speak, of bi bioactive metabolites, um, you know, before jumping deeper into to one specific metabolite uh, in terms of what, what, what's happening. Very good. So I think we are coming at the end of our uh, session. 
Uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending the webinar, and I would like to thank Dr. Cohen for uh, giving this webinar. Uh, we will be sending you the slides and the uh, recording after this webinar. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.